Centro. You know, through the program I supervise, CalFresh Healthy Living, we do provide technical assistance at around 20 plus garden sites around the county, from schools to public housing sites. And our goal, the goal of our program is to reach the most vulnerable population in Imperial County. With me today, I have my co-host, Christopher Wong, CalFresh Healthy Living Community Education Specialist, part of the CalFresh program as well. And before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to let everyone know that we do have all the lines muted. If you have any questions, please, please feel free to use the chat box. Um, my co-host Chris will be monitoring the chat box and we will address all questions at the end of today's webinar. So with that, I'll go ahead and introduce our today's speaker. And today we have UC Cooperative Extension, Imperial County's um, Brooke Latak. Uh, she is our livestock advisor here in Imperial County. Um, just some background about Brooke. She graduated from Michigan State University with a bachelor's and master's in animal science, focusing on environmental impacts of livestock production. She worked on projects involving a broad range of management practices and integrated interactions between crop and livestock production to understand the sustainability of animal protein production. And with that, she's here today to share her expertise when it comes to livestock and gardening. So thank you for being with us today, Brooke, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, so like Paul said, I'm the livestock advisor down here and I cover a good chunk of the desert of California. So I cover Imperial, Riverside and San Bernardino counties. Um, but uh, I personally love the idea of using livestock wherever we can use them. I think they're beneficial and I think they're fun. So I just kind of want to go through um, some of the benefits, some of the drawbacks and um, kind of how we can address those drawbacks and then what to think through when you're considering using livestock in your garden, um, whether you're just getting started and want are considering livestock or if you have livestock and are maybe trying to integrate them a little more. Um, and so that's kind of what I want to cover. There's a lot that could go into using livestock in general. Um, so this is going to be a fairly broad uh, conversation. So if you have more specific questions, feel free to ask those in the chat box, like Paul said. Um, so first, we're going to go into the benefits and the drawbacks. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is pest control. Uh, so a lot of the livestock I'm going to talk about today is chickens because um, they're a fairly common backyard livestock animal that people raise. Um, plus, they do really well in smaller gardens because they are also small. And they're allowed in many places, whereas goats, uh, cattle, and stuff like that sometimes are not allowed. But I will talk about some of um, the small ruminants and even large ruminants and what the, how you can use them to benefit your garden. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is pest control. And again, this is really going to hit on the chickens because they do a really great job eating the insect pests. Um, which will reduce the damage that those insects are doing to your plants. Um, and it will reduce the need for pest control methods. Um, so, you know, talking about not chickens, if we want to talk about goats and sheep, um, if you want to graze those down uh, at, in your off season, that can get rid of those homes that those pests can over, or not over winter, but um, in your off season, uh, when they reproduce and stuff like that, it takes away that ability for them to reproduce. Um, so you have less pests in the next season. Some of the drawbacks, um, they will also eat the beneficial insects, um, which you can't really train them to eat one over the other. Uh, some of them do not like some of the, the non-beneficial pests. Some of them really like the beneficial pests. So you can't really tell them to eat one or the other. And then livestock bring their own pests. So flies are a big one um, with manure and with, you know, just the dander and things they bring. Flies really like there. And then mice and other vertebrae pests that are attracted to the feed, um, the actual animals, the piles of manure, stuff like that. So um, you kind of have to balance the pests that they're eating and the pests that they're going to be bringing in. And so, um, 
what what we see as gardeners, you know, we see these slugs as a harmful pest and we don't want them. And we see uh, this other this other insect as a beneficial insect predator. Um, you know, they'll take care of the the harmful pests. But what a chicken sees is two foods. So um, they're not really gonna pick one. They may pick one over the other, but it may be not be to the benefit of the garden. Um, another thing is weed control. Uh, again, this is great because you, if you don't enjoy weeding, um, this is a way to do it where it reduces your labor um, and it reduces the need for other weed control methods. And if you're hand weeding, if you enjoy weeding or if you think it's more effective, you can still feed those uh, weeds to your livestock. So, you know, you can kind of offset some of your feed that you're feeding them with those weeds. Um, and there are some weeds that they absolutely love. Um, drawback, they will eat your plants and they will eat your vegetables that you yourself would like to eat. Um, so managing when they're in the garden and what they have access to is important because they could also do more damage than benefit. They may be selective in weeds, so they may love some weeds and they may not touch others, depending on maturity, depending on the type of weeds. And then another, another issue is they may spread the weed seeds. So um, a study looked at seed survival in livestock. So they fed the animals weed seeds and um, about 25% of the seeds that they fed to cattle and swine uh, were intact and were able to be planted and grow. Chickens are more effective because the, um, they grind up those seeds a little bit more. So 2% made it through the chicken and then sheep and horses about 10 to 12%. So you can see chickens are a little more effective in damaging those weed seeds so that they can't grow. Um, the thing is though, uh, of the 25% that got through the cattle and swine, only about um, 20, uh, a small amount actually germinated. So they may still get damaged in the digestive tract. So you may not have to worry about germination. Whereas of the 2% of the um, chicken seeds that made it through, 62% of those germinated. So there's, there may be something that, you know, their digestive tract is helping them germinate if it makes it through successfully. Um, so just something to think about um, when, when you're, if you have a very mature weedy area and you want to graze your animals there and get rid of those weeds with the animals and the, the plants are going to seed, this may be something you wanna consider when you're using their manure in the future. And then obviously having animals on your garden is gonna add nutrients to the soil through their manure. Um, so again, this is gonna reduce need for part of fertilizer uh, it may not offset all of the fertilizer you need um, and improve soil quality through putting organic matter back into the soil and those nutrients. Um, so if we're looking at what they're putting in, obviously if you have cattle, you're gonna get a lot of manure. And then when you have you know, poultry, it's gonna be a whole lot less just because they're smaller. Um, and this is how many pounds per day they're, they're producing. Um, but what I wanna draw your attention to is um, I, I just did a ratio of the pounds of nitrogen in that manure versus the pounds of manure that they're creating. Um, and you can see that the poultry manure is a lot more concentrated with that nitrogen. Um, so when you're thinking about, well, how much do I need? You'll have to remember that um, poultry are gonna have a highly concentrated manure, whereas cattle um, are gonna have a lot less of a concentrated manure. Um, a drawback though, with that high concentration in poultry manure, it can cause damage to plants. So if there's just too much nitrogen, um, it, it, can, it can damage that. So knowing what your, um, what your garden needs, how much fertilizer you need, how much nitrogen you need, how much nitrogen the plant is going to use, um, and making sure you're using your livestock in a way that benefits those plants is important. Um, bedding, if you're using bedding, it will affect how much the nutrients in the manure. Um, so you have to offset some of that as well. Um, and then 
the, uh, the big thing is um, pathogens. Manure is a, uh, a, an obvious source of pathogens. So when you're handling manure, it's important to be careful. And when you're using it, and we'll talk about this more a little later on how to do that safely, but this is one of the, the biggest issues with using raw manure is that the likelihood of pathogens is fairly high. Um, so looking at pathogens, what's the issue? One in six Americans are gonna get sick from food board pathogens, and that's a whole range of them, but there are, I think, only a handful that are really the biggest culprits in this. Um, and, you know, people are hospitalized and they die due to these. So they are an important factor, um, even when we're just talking about our home gardens. Uh, people think about it from a commercial standpoint, but really um, looking at it from a home garden standpoint is equally important. So where does it come from? Water, animals, domestic and wild. So um, it's not always, your livestock in your backyard. It could be a mouse that gets in, it could be a rabbit. Um, it can come from any animal, including humans. So it's something to think about. The gardener themselves transferring it from one place to the other, obviously manure, and then the tools using uh, tools in multiple areas can actually transfer. Um, and so um, one, one, oh, and then home gardens, are not necessarily less likely to have pathogen contamination just because they're not commercial. They need the same amount of um, safety implemented when, when, when growing food that will be consumed raw. It's very important. There's always a risk, especially when you're using livestock. Um, and one study showed that um, wild birds, wild geese, and domestic cattle all had the same strain of E. coli, which meant there was a single source that all of them had um, gotten that same strain of E. coli. So it can pass through all animals. It can move through ecosystems. It is not a sedentary pathogen. Um, these pathogens can move. They can get wherever they want to get. Um, pathogens don't just appear. They get there from something. Uh, so some of them, you know, the big ones, obviously E. coli, we've dealt with that recently with all of the romaine outbreaks. Um, salmonella and listeria are some fairly prevalent ones in uh, manure. And then viruses can get transferred in manure and then parasites too. And these, this is especially important if you have people in your home who are very, very young, elderly or pregnant um, because they are at most risk. But one of the things that's important is the incubation period for many of these can be days. And if we're sharing our homegrown food with our friends and our family, that means we could be sharing uh, contaminated food without knowing it until people are sick. So making sure that we're being safe is really important, not just for us, but for the people we're sharing with. Um, so raw manure and incorrectly treated manure, and we'll talk a little bit about treated manure, they have a higher prevalence of pathogens compared to treated manure, um, but treated manure still may have pathogens. Treating manure does not guarantee that it's free of all pathogens. Um, and so a study showed that after about 120 days, the, the E. coli amounts decreased considerably after 120 days. Um, and the study took monthly samples of the soil and 55% of those, after using raw manure, and 55% of those samples came back positive for E. coli. Um, and 3% of the lettuce that they tested also came back positive for E. coli. Um, and this was on certified organic farms. So, you know, e again, even though this is commercial, it's, it's fairly applicable even on a small scale. So some of the bigger things is, really trying to practice food safety through the entire growing process. These pathogens can latch on at any point of growth from seed all the way up to the mature plant. So, you know, washing your vegetables is great. You should do that, but that does not mean it will take all of that pathogen off. They attach to the leaves really strongly, especially E. coli. It's got special ways of attaching. You can't really just wash it off. 
Um, so you want to make sure you're not letting your manure touch the edible portion of the part plant. So if you're using root vegetables, that also means, um, you know, not having any raw manure right on that root. Um, and then um, one intervention is not going to stop pathogen contamination. We need to look at it from a whole system. So how do we treat, how do we manage our pathogens from from the beginning of our gardening season to the very, very end when we're harvesting and consuming. Um, and so again, this is especially important when we're growing raw foods or foods that will be consumed raw. So addressing these drawbacks, one of the, the more simple ways is fencing. Um, obviously it protects the plants so they won't be eaten or damaged. It still allows the livestock to exist on the perimeter and still get those bugs as they're flying around in and out. Um, and it reduces the risk of pathogen contamination because the animals don't have that direct contact with the plants. And so you, you can do something simple or you know something fairly secure like this chicken wire. Um, you can do a plastic chicken wire and I've seen people literally just put this trellis kind of in front of their garden and hope that the chickens don't get through. It really does depend though on the animal. If you're using larger animals like goats and sheep, um, it's you're gonna wanna have it more secure because they're a lot stronger, but chickens can also be fairly crafty and get through things. So just trying to make sure you get any points where they may escape and get into your garden uh, will really reduce the risk of those. And so it can be fairly simple um, like here, they just have a fence around, a simple fence around their entire garden area, keeps out pests and the pets. Um, again, pests are one thing you really want to keep out of your garden as well because they also carry a lot of those pathogens and viruses that are harmful to humans. Or you could go a little more complex and build yourself a chicken moat, which is, um, is really just uh, you fence in around the garden and then you give another fence and you create a little area that the chickens can move around, walk around the garden. It concentrates all of their manure. So if you'd like to use their manure later or compost it, you can go and scoop it and it's all in one area, really nice, easy to clean. And then you can have their coop still attached so that they have that safety in the evening so predators can't get to them. So this, they, you can do very, very simple fixes or you can do more complex things. Um, and so, and it depends on what your existing animal handling methods are right now. Another method is timing the garden access of livestock. Um, so this means not always having your livestock have access to your garden, but picking strategic times where they can best help your garden. So this, again, it reduces the risk of pathogen contamination. I'll explain how it does that. Um, again, no worry about harming pla uh, plants. It, it gives a superficial tilling with all their walking around and scratching at the dirt to try to get those plants out. We control for the next growing period and then again, sustain pest control by getting those the pest homes out of there so they can't reproduce. So one of the big things doing this, um, the USDA has uh, rules for organic producers. And one of the rules is, is if you're letting animals graze a vegetable area or using raw manure, you have to allow 120 days or more before, um, before planting. And they found through research that anything less than 120 days, there's still E. coli and there's still that risk. But after 120 days, it, that risk is si significantly lower. Um, again, don't concentrate animals on too small of an area. If you have a really small area you want them to, to eat, uh, make sure you're not overworking that area. Um, and then work in the manure after removing the animals. So an example timeline would be this, based on the 120 days is um, if you have a fall garden, having the animals in the garden in May, in the May month, having four full months in between and then planting in October. This will give time for the E. coli to, um, to be significantly reduced, but you still get the benefit of them removing the weeds from the previous season 
Um, and you're not worried about them eating the plants that you want them to eat because you're done, you've harvested. So they can just eat what's left. Less work for you because you don't really have to manage much once you're done harvesting. So another big way to um, use livestock is by using their manure. Um, so compost kills weed seeds, which may be in the more manure as we discussed. It can kill most pathogens. It may not kill all of them, um, depending on how you do it. And it improves soil properties, just like the manure did. Um, so there's many methods of compost. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, but all of the compost needs to reach the correct temperature in order to get rid of those pathogens. So it needs to be turned regularly. You need to be using a thermometer. Um, and it needs adequate uh, moisture. So those are some really important factors. We have a lot of really good resources that we will be sent out with a resource list um, about compost, but that's kind of the basic main parts. And it can take several weeks to months to finish. So timing your compost with how you want to use it is important. Um, and don't use cat or dog feces again. Uh, it's really important that any domestic pets, we don't use any of their manure. Um, so when you're doing compost, you want to have a, um, a carbon to nitrogen ratio of about 30 to 1 for some really good compost. And as you can see, um, ant livestock manure is a little on the low side for that. So you can complement it with leaves and grass clippings and kitchen waste and stuff like that to bring up that carbon to nitrogen ratio to get a really, really nice um, uh, uh, compost. But bedding will increase the carbon to nitrogen ratio, so you may not need to add anything else if you're using bedding. But again, it just depends on your system and how you're doing things. Again, it can reduce the pathogen risk, but it will not guarantee it, um, especially if everything's not heated correctly. And then use separate tools for different parts of your garden. Um, so try not to cross contaminate and use, if you use a shovel to pick up manure with your livestock, try not to use that shovel in your garden, um, because that is an easy way to transfer pathogens from one part to the other. Um, and if you need to, if you, if you don't want to have multiple shovels and redundant things, thoroughly clean the tools between each the, um, between each part of your garden. Still try to keep them separate because that is a very, very easy way of getting pathogens. And then obviously washing hands, especially if you're handling the chickens, handling your livestock, and then you wanna go grab some of the produce you see that's nice and ripe, make sure you wash your hands in between. So just some considerations to make when integrating your livestock in your garden. Um, what is your goal of having livestock? I think that's the one thing I ask people, even if we're not talking about garden, what's the goal? Um, if you want them only to improve your garden, that's one thing. If you just love livestock and want livestock and just want to integrate them in since you have them, that's another thing. But it will help you frame how you're managing your livestock and how you're managing your garden. Uh, will the garden benefit from the livestock? Um, some may not, and that's okay. Um, so really just thinking about how it would benefit your garden. How many animals are you going to use? Uh, will you need supplemental feed? A lot of the time, gardens aren't going to provide all of the nutrients animals need, so you, you'll probably need supplemental feed. And depending on how big your garden is and how many animals you have, you may still need supplemental for fertilizer you may not have enough to cover the entire garden. How prolific are your pests and weed issues? Do you not have many weeds? Do you not have many pests? Um, that may mean you don't need a big complicated system for managing them. Is it legal to have livestock in your neighborhood? Um, even chickens, some areas do not allow chickens. So it's important to know what's legal. And then are you prepared to implement safety practices for pathogens? I think that's the biggest one, um, making sure you have a plan of action to make sure that you're mitigating a lot of that risk. Um, maybe there's a different part of your garden that is not growing raw vegetables that you could put that manure on so you don't have that risk. So just thinking about stuff like that um, really helps. Structures, do you want fencing to be permanent or temporary? Do you want those fences around around your planting beds 
to come off really easy or, you know, are you okay cementing posts in to make them extra strong? Um, that's something that's important to, to think about when you're thinking about the kind of livestock you have and what you want them to do. Where will you put your structures? In order to make sure that we're reducing pathogen risk and pests from the livestock enclosure, maximizing the distance between your livestock, your garden, and if you have compost pile that, um, your compost pile, making sure that you maximize your distance as much as you can. And I know some people don't have a lot of room, so it's not super easy to do, but it's something to think about. And then how accessible are the structures and fencing? Can you get into your garden to do your garden activities or are you kind of stuck outside with the animals? Um, and then can let the livestock enter the garden when you need them to? And then are they kept out when they really should not be in there? And then when will they have access to the garden? Again, best time to reduce the pathogen contamination risk is that 120 plus days. Um, and if you have a continuous garden that never stops, this may not be a uh, something you can do. So figuring out a way that reduces that pathogen risk but still lets you integrate livestock is great. Um, when will you need compost? Again, it takes time to properly compost. So just think about timing and what works for you. And then cost. Obviously, how much do you want to invest? Typically, feed is going to be one of the more expensive parts of owning livestock or really any animal. Um, and then the cost of structures, fencing, um, and then if you're gone, who's taking care of those animals, feeding them, maintaining them. And then do you want a cost saving system? Do you want them to save money on fertilizer, on pest control, on weed control? Um, if you don't, that's great. That's perfect because then you don't really have to think about that. But if you do, then that's something you'll want to think about. So final thoughts. We really want to minimize pathogen contamination and plant destruction. So using fencing, making sure you adhere to that 120 day rule, um, using manure and not the non vegetable part of your garden and maintaining tool cleanliness uh, will go a, a long way in maintaining your garden, but still allowing you to use livestock and then plan what works for you. I would encourage everyone to be super creative. I think there's a ton of different ways to do this super well um, and still really in benefit the garden. Um, so looking at cost, additional work of raising livestock, what space you have, what timing you have, and what type of plants you're using. Any questions? Thank you, Brooke, for that great presentation. Chris, um, were there any questions for, for Brooke? So uh, Johar says, I have an area of my property where I have to keep, I have kept goats for years. I now want to put a garden in that area. The plan is to clean the area as much as possible, till the dirt and then put raised beds in. Should I still wait the 120 days prior to putting raised beds and planting anything? I would, I would recommend waiting the 120 days just because all of that mixing and moving um, of the dirt and stuff like that it you know if you're using raised beds it may decrease the likelihood but that e coli may still be there and it's very very difficult to get rid of so there still may be some cross contamination and all of your preparation work and all of that so i would say the 120 days is still a good idea even with raised beds I see another question right here. And um, so is there a specific reason for not using domestic animal waste in your garden? Yes, so um, that goes back again to pathogens that they carry specifically. Um, and I don't know all of them off the top of my head, but they do carry specific pathogens that um, aren't guaranteed to be killed during the composting process. So really, you know, it may kill most of them, but to be extra safe, domestic pets really um, shouldn't. And I think um, a lot of commercial composting operations have the same um, thought process there. Um, and I don't see any more questions, but I do have one. 
Um, I really like how you had all the considerations, you know, before, you know, bringing livestock into your garden. Is there a resource available where, where we can have like a, a tangible document with maybe those types of considerations or Sure. Um, I have several that kind of have a similar thought process, but I could also put one together myself that lists the ones that I put together from all the different documents I, I've been going through and all that. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. And yes, this um, webinar is being recorded. Uh, Chris put the link in the chat box and it will be housed on the Cooperative Extension Imperial UCANR gardening webinar series link that he answered in the chat box. Um, so if there are any more questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. And if not, I think that should wrap it up. Um, we'll give it a couple minutes to see if anybody has any other questions. Again, thank you, Brooke, for the, the great presentation. And for all those in attendance, we hope you join us for our next one. Um, it's November 18th on a Wednesday, and this one will be Harvest to Table, Using Herbs in the Kitchen. And that, that'll, that'll be with our partners at FarmSmart, at UC FarmSmart from the Desert Research and Extension Center. So we invite you to join that webinar. For those that are on the Facebook gardening group, we will post uh, the announcement on the Facebook group, you know, so you can join us on November 18th, you know, with the FarmSmart team. And I don't see any more questions. So yeah, again, thank, thank you for, to everyone for joining us today. We appreciate your attendance. And if you have any questions for Brooke that you know come after today, her, her contact information is on the slide below. Her email's right there. So feel free to contact Brooke with any questions. Um, we will be posting the webinar after the edits are made and we will have some resources linked to that as well. So thank you for joining us, everyone. We appreciate your attendance. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Brooke.